system of mutual respect and working together, even though you know, the actual fields of knowledge are separate. Um, each values what the other can do. And if you take um, sort of the, the negative approach to the non-geek, um, you risk alienating us. You know, if my fiance doesn't treat people, they don't get better. Uh, so she has no computer because it's broken because nobody's helping her and people are going sick because she's not helping them. Um, obviously, I think this is not a working, uh, a working model. Um, what's needed is mutual respect. Uh, if, if the problem, uh, one of the problems is lack of respect, um, you gotta build it rather than just say, oh, these people are idiots. Um, another thing that I've seen is what I call the, the edge model from the edge.org. Um, Back in the, well, actually back in 5960 when uh, Snow wrote about the, the two cultures, he started thinking about what he called the third culture, which is uh, essentially people who can bridge that gap. Um, and this is something John, John Brockman at the Edge Foundation, he really has taken on this mantle and run with it. Um, and he says that the third con culture consists of scientists and other thinkers in the empirical world who through their work and expository writing are taking the place of the traditional intellectual and rendering visible the deeper meanings of our lives, redefining who and what we are. Um, which is, it's a quite an interesting site. I mean, there are some smart people on there. And they do try to, you know, as scientists, predominantly scientists, bridge this gap between the two cultures by explaining in non-scientific terms what is going on. Um, and what the things that they are discovering about um, psychology, uh, neuroscience, about physics, what that says about the human experience. And there's quite a lot to be learned from that, but at the same time, uh, the EDGE mission is to arrive at the edge of the world's knowledge, seek out the most complex and sophisticated minds, put them in a room together, and have them ask the questions they are asking themselves. It's a really good idea, but I am not one of the world's most complex and sophisticated minds. Um, I'm kind of average. Uh, so uh, the edge model of trying to bridge the gap from the top, take the smartest scientist you can find and talk to people, they're gonna reach the smartest non-scientist types, but they're probably not going to really bridge the gap in terms of creating a culture, a society at large, where you know, science and technology are respected. If anything, they might further the sort of the divide between the educated in general, and the uh, people who don't have high-level degrees like I do. Um, it's, it's a start, but it doesn't provide the understanding of technology, which is the other aspect of uh, the two cultures, or the other problem of the two cultures divide. Um, so the third thing that I've seen is what I call the Mozilla model. Uh, Blake Ross was at the City Club here in Cleveland um, last year. He was talking about how when he and Dave Hyatt uh, developed Mozilla, what they did is, or well, Mozilla Firefox, what they did is they actually sat down with people. They went to like local coffee shops and bookstores and whatnot and sat down at free tables with a sign that said, sit down if you hate computers. Because they found out that the people who they'd been working with, um, you know, in Netscape and whatever, at, at these usability labs would have this completely non-realistic environment where they would sit somebody down at a computer and say, oh, can you do this, can you do this, can you do this, and see how the user interacted with the, with the machine in ways that were not related to how like, people every day use their machines. Uh, Ross said he was quite surprised. You know, a lot of those, at least the, those so-called experts, would be quite surprised how the normal person uses their computer, particularly when it's not doing what they want it to. Um, it's certainly not what you're going to find in a uh, usability workshop. So he sat down with people. He, instead of deciding what needed to be fixed, then testing it in usability lab to see if he had done it, he went to people and said, what don't you like about surfing? And they said, I hate pop-ups. And he said, oh, wait, we can do something about that. And they said, I just want it to be simple. You know, I don't want all these things that uh, Internet Explorer has. And he said, oh, we can do that. Um, so this, I think, you know, working with people at the low level on what people want and what they're doing with the technology that's in their hands, even if they don't understand it, they can explain to you what they're not getting from it and what they want from it, and you can work with them. 
And this, I think, builds sort of both the respect and the understanding in that you're working with people who, are, who you know, are smart enough to tell you what's going on and they can appreciate that you're fixing it, but they don't have to learn the details themselves. They can if they want to, but it's not, it's not a requirement. Um, so from the non-geek point of view, uh, which is mine, um, and speaking to uh, a group of hackers, I have to say that the, the two things that I think you should do are, um, one is tell your story better. Explain what it is you do and why it's important in a better way, because I don't think people understand. Um, and I think a lot of this has to do with the way that the story is told. Uh, Chip and Dan Heath uh, were a couple authors, recently wrote a book called Made to Stick, Why Some Ideas Survive and Others Die. And they looked at why it is that urban legends, concepts, advertising campaigns, that sort of thing, stick in the mind and why others don't. Um, and they said that what you need to do is tell simple, unexpected, concrete, credible, emotional stories. Um, and if you were to write that down, you would notice that the acronym for that is SUCCESS, without the S. Yes, it's cheesy, but uh, simple acronyms like that are that sort of thing. They help people remember, um, even if you might roll your eyes a bit at, at, at the word itself. Um, and when talking about technology, I think you guys run into an automatic problem with the, uh, there's a tension between simplicity and concreteness, because to explain technology simply, you know, quite quickly, it's going to be abstract. The concept of email is an abstraction. It's not much like mail, but people understand, oh, email, I write something and I send it and somebody else gets it. Um, but if you actually try and explain packet switching and the details to it, you're concrete. You're telling them actually how it works, but it's no longer simple. They're not going to follow you. Um, Another uh, talk I was listening to at the, uh, at the City Club last year was Vint Cerf came in and described his thinking when he was developing uh, packet switching uh, at DARPA. Um, and he was trying to explain it in terms of, think of email as sending mail, you're sending information, but uh, you're dividing it up as it, though it were postcards, uh, and you're sending them in different ways so that if you know, one mail route gets blocked, they can be rerouted. But then, because they're being sent differently, you have to number them. And if you number them, then sometimes they get out of order. So you have to you know, have a system which puts them back in order. And then if they get caught up at one route, uh, you have to have a buffering system. And his, suddenly, his relatively simple analogy of sending a letter, or sending you know, an email and sending a letter, it suddenly you know, loses ground because you're bringing in all of these analogies and metaphors that you know, aren't, aren't quite working. And Frankly, on this one, I don't have an answer uh, for you guys. I don't think there's a way to explain technology simply, but also uh, concretely. Um, either you're going to explain it simply and just it's going to be abstract and you know, people are just going to have to deal with that, or you can try and explain to people concretely what is actually going on, and they're going to have to accept that it's not simple. Um, what I think is the issue is uh, the other, some of the other aspects of, of uh, Chip and Dan's Heath... Uh, idea is credibility and the emotional value. Um, people value things for emotional reasons, not for technical reasons. People value email because it allows them to communicate quite quickly with people around the world. With, you know, they, if they go off to college or whatever, they can send back and forth to your parents. If you go, you know, uh, you, you can, if you find something that you like online, you can quickly email the author of it. People value that on an emotional level and it's credible. They do it, they see it, and they, they say, oh, this gets done, and it, it's important to me. So they end up valuing the people who can provide them that service. Um, so if you are, you know, if you're working in the IT field, and you're, you know, you're the network manager at a, at a place, and people ask you, oh, what do you do? You can try and bridge this thing of simplicity and complexity, because it's a complex job, and you, you might have, not have time in, like, in elevator ride to explain what the hell you're doing, but... If you are credible, if you say, oh, I keep the network running. You know all that stuff that you do? I'm the one who keeps the wires connected. They're going to get that because it's credible and also because they're invested in it. You're, you're telling them that you help them do what they're doing. 
Um, and I think it's that way that, you know, you, it's, it's, you're going to have trouble with that simplicity complexity thing, but if you tell them the truth, the credible, you know, this is what I do, and this is why it's important, because you use it all the time, um, I think people are going to say, hey, oh, hey, I like you, please continue, I'll pay you a lot of money. Um, but one of the problems is, uh, there's only so far you can go with, even with the most simplest uh, and abstract explanation, if people don't understand what it is that you're doing, if they just think that the computer is a magical tool uh, that they log into and you know, it somehow works, and they don't understand even the basics, no matter how much you can try and convince them, oh yeah, back in this other room here, I'm doing something, they might think you're doing a voodoo dance or you know, they, they have no idea. Um, you have to work, you have to tell people who understand what the hell that you're talking about, um, what you do. And here, I think, is where uh, the hacker community has to get involved in the community at large. Essentially, you have to get political. Um, and political, I don't mean partisan. I don't mean supporting this candidate or that candidate and getting into the muck that really makes civic life, particularly in this country, with uh, all of our you know, combativeness between the, the, the two-party system. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about political in the traditional sense of looking at society, looking at what you think should be done, and working on it. Um, so uh, there are a lot of advocacy groups that do some politics, but they also just advocate for general understanding. The Hacker Foundation, um, Electronic Frontier Foundation, Internet Society, there are a lot of groups that do these sort of things. And they want you. <laughs> they are coming, Hacker Foundation, in fact, came to this particular uh, con to say, join us. Um, because they help you know, develop the hacker community, but they also connect, you know, they look at what's going on in the wider world and promote the hacker view outside. Um, and there's a lot of things that they're doing, looking at the way that laws are implemented, but the thing that I think is most important is education. Um, hackers should promote educational initiatives uh, where they can. And by this, I mean uh, technical education is quite important. Um, getting good tech standards so that people you know, know what's going on in, on the technological side of things and they understand you know, when you hand them some new tech, they can start using it and there's not a lot of hiccup with uh, new users trying to figure stuff out. Um, and also, you know, I was listening to Kelly Keegan's uh, talk yesterday about trying to bring the internet, the way students actually use it into the classroom, as opposed to, you know, teach, sitting them down in rows and teaching them in traditional ways that aren't related to how people interact, particularly on the internet anymore. Um, and that's, you know, that's an important sort of thing to think about: is look at how education works um, in your in your in your local school board. But I'm also talking about education generally, because, um, like I said, I'm I'm not a hacker. It's not I appreciate the sort of stuff you do, and I've used technology for quite a while, because my dad is a, is a research chemist. We've had, had a computer since um, the early 80s. It was an Olivetti M20, actually, was our first one. So even before PCs were the norm. Um, but it's, you know, I didn't get into it. I almost kind of wish I had. My early introduction, I could have you know, made a gazillion dollars in the dot-com boom and still been poor now, because I would have lost it all, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> but I didn't go that road. I, I'm interested in different stuff. I'm the sociology type. I just, that's what I like. But my education was good. And having a good education makes me think about stuff, which makes me understand if you give me a basic explanation of what the hell it is that you're doing, I'll go, oh, I see. You know, I might not know the details, but I'll get the gist of it. And I'll see where you're coming from, and I'll respect what you do. And I'll say, oh, yes, what they do is important, and we should, you know, we, we should support them. Um, so, Yes, get behind the technical you know, initiatives for education um, and get behind the, like the, the particularly from the Cleveland area, the whole ingenuity, creative economy sort of thing, but also get behind education generally. You know, support, look at how much people are or are not learning in our culture and, uh, and in our society and say, you know, ask yourselves what you can do about it. Um, so those are my two real points. Uh, find a good way to tell people what you do, and why it's important, um, and promote the sort of culture, you know, get involved in society at large so that the person that you're talking to understands you and can meet you halfway, even if they're not from the scene, even if they don't get the details of it, 
they're at least you know, well-educated enough that they 